Ice, ice, baby. Remember guides, everyone. Videos that covered topics big and small that usually helped but were maybe occasionally not needed. Yeah, me too. It's why I come before you today to discuss one of the most important resources in the entire game. Ice. But... Hold up, Beard. I don't even see any ice around you. Plus, it's autumn for Pete's sake. There can't be ice before winter, right? Wrong. Naturally spawned mini glaciers can actually begin their stage growth in the very early days of the game. It takes one to three days for each of their three stages to progress to full. However, stage one here will be the max for the time being. For you see, the temperature of the world impacts the growth of many glaciers. It will not be until late in the first autumn when you may notice that the blocks of ice are growing just a tad bit more. And then it will be another day or two, or three, after the white stuff begins to fall in order to see fully formed mini glaciers. That's great and all, but... Where exactly do we find them? Simply put, darn near anywhere where rocky turf is a thing. Now, that is not to say that there will be a mini glacier spawn on all patches of rocky turf, but the potential is there, especially within the rocky land biomes themselves. Every world generated will vary, of course. However, ice is one of those resources that is seemingly always abundant, which is a good thing. And another good thing is that we don't actually have to solely rely on natural glacier spawns either. Running along sources of ocean during the winter season has a very decent chance to spawn pangles. And pangles then proceed to form nearby colonies and breeding grounds that just so happen to spawn numerous mini glaciers to boot. Yup, if you are looking for the cold stuff, this is how you get your hands on loads of it, as pangles can be spawned like crazy over and over. Few last notes on glaciers here though, darn near every stage has a chance to drop one to three pieces of ice. So. The lowest possible yield one could get is but three pieces, while the highest amount of ice a glacier can give you is nine. Not bad at all. What is bad is that one could potentially destroy a mini glacier spawn altogether if they're not careful. Having a relatively strong heat source near one will not only quickly melt a glacier stage, leaving said heat source near the resulting puddle can then and will be rid of the entire thing as well. It is a neat little mechanic that probably not many know about for sure. But it really shouldn't be done. Ice is just too darn important. But finally, know that while naturally spawned glaciers will begin to melt come spring, with them pretty much being fully unavailable in summer, they will return come the following autumn. The glaciers spawned by pangles, however, will remain until summer, yes. However, they will permanently despawn and not return in the subsequent autumn. It's the same deal with the pangles. You're just going to have to spawn more. Now, the cold stuff itself. Ice is actually edible. However, pay no mind to that 0.5 health per chunk because it's bloody nonsense. Furthermore, while it does ever so slightly lower our temperatures, it can only lower them to around 30 degrees anyways. So don't expect to be eating yourself frozen this time. Some big notes to take away from ice alone though. It will never, ever melt in an ice box, nor will it even melt in your inventory. As long as it's winter, that is. Otherwise, the stuff will melt in three days naturally. However, having it near heat will in fact speed that process up. Furthermore, if ice happens to melt while in your inventory, your wetness will climb by two points for every piece of ice gone. So, if you had 12 ice melt on you, that's 24 wetness instantly. Cool stuff. 
but it just keeps rolling. We can use ice to quickly and effectively put out smoldering objects as well as douse full-blown fires. Not bad at all. And finally, let us not forget that ice can serve as a wide-ranging filler for just about any crockpot recipe that needs such a thing. And since ice never melts in ice boxes, it is quite frankly the best filler there could possibly be. Very. Very nice. But as long as we're here, we may as well talk recipes that require the stuff now, right? Right. And ice cream comes first with its whopping zero health, 25 hunger, and 50 sanity, along with a nice cooling effect. But who would have guessed that ice cream would need ice? Scoop it up or lick it up instead. Melon sickles are a thing, and these things restore 3 health, 12.5 hunger, and 20 sanity each. Oh, they too also cool us down a bit. So, there you go. Nothing overly special here though. Nanner Pops, such a staple of Don't Starve Shipwrecked for being a great restorer of both health and sanity. Yet, I forget they are still a thing in Don't Starve Together all the flippin' time. Oh well, here they are, I guess. Quit muckying around and go get you some. Lobster bisque is yet another ice-requiring crockpot dish, and certainly one of the most recent to boot. The recipe is quite simple, and for your troubles, you will enjoy 25 hunger, 10 sanity, and 60 health to slurp. Not bad at all. Just beware the claws. And lastly, ceviche, a dish forgotten in both Shipwrecked and Don't Starve Together. Be sure to have a fish value of two at the least in order to munch on some fish guts worth 20 health, 25 hunger, and 5 sanity. But enough food talk. Let's fire through the ice-specific crafts to wrap up the day. Starting with the ice cube, which all in all is about as straightforward as things come. It is a shoob of melting ice that sits atop your noggin and it will slow you down, make you wet to up to 50 wetness, and keep you cool during summer. Although there are objectively better options, the ice shoob really ain't all that bad. Plus, we can quote-unquote refuel it with additional ice if we wish as well. Plus, keeping it in an ice box will prevent it from melting altogether. Just be mindful though that it will make your inventory items wet, which will result in sanity loss. Ah, the ice flingomatic. Don't think I need to explain this one very much. They will help to stop base fires in summer, or if misclicks happen, prevent smoldering in general, or can be used in advanced farms. At the end of the day, they are how you fight fire, so make them. Oh, water balloons, you could be so, so much better if you weren't limited in use, especially considering when each craft yields four balloons in total. But here's the thing about water balloons, everybody. While they can be thrown to prevent and extinguish fires and or be thrown at players to raise their wetness and or drop their temperatures, that's it. Water balloons only work on other players, smoldering or on fire objects, and even dragonfly. But if Clay made it to where we can raise the wetness of all mobs with balloons, the possibilities could be endless with the electrical damage at play. So do it, Clay. Ah, yes, the fish scalomatic doesn't get easier to understand than this one, folks. Craft it, place it where you please, toss in your fishies, and you'll see how much they weigh. Yup, that's all she wrote. But finally, the moon dial. A pretty cool magic structure that unfortunately has been made obsolete via mods. That said, if you want to know the phases of the moon, as well as have a pretty darn sweet looking pool of lunar water come a full moon, then get to crafting it. And there you have it everyone, a guide on ice in Don't Starve Together. It truly is one of the greatest resources in this game, and leads to cool crafts, chili recipes, and frigid feelings. Thanks for watching, folks. Well wishes to all. Stay frosty, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.